Age of Chivalry is where it all began. Released in 2007, it was just a Half-Life 2 mod, yes. Like many other behemoth games these days, Chivalry's long run also began on Half-Life 2. Jesus Christ, that game did a lot for the industry. Based on the Source engine, it looked, well, awful. But this was back in the day when gameplay was king, so graphics didn't matter all that much. The mod itself, though, was developed by Team Chivalry, and thus a franchise began. It aimed to bring intense, close combat battles within the first-person perspective, something not done all too much before, or if ever. Age of Chivalry really was one of the first. This is where we got the introduction of the Agatha Knights and the Mason Order, two ruling factions pitting a stalemate of a war to rule the kingdom. The game itself had a number of maps, all with unique game modes and objectives. And this is where the famous chivalry game modes were spawned from. Take a strategic points, killing villagers, or pushing siege engines up to castles in massive scale modes. Gameplay wise, you can see how similar it is to much of what we have today. It's clearly a much older game, but the basics of the combat, weaponry, gory nature, and interactable objects in the train is clear to see. There was even decapitation and complete throwing weapon projectile mechanics back in the day. Honestly, a bit of a game changer for the historical scene. The mod itself was fairly popular. Nothing on the mainstream scale that we have these days, but for the time, in 2007, when medieval and historical games were pretty much just limited to real-time strategies, there was definitely a growing want and a fan base for this sort of title. So Team Chivalry decided to take it further. In 2010, Steve Piggott of Team Chivalry wanted to take their idea to another level, and thus Torn Banner Studios was founded. Their first endeavour out on their own commercial trail would be Chivalry Medieval Warfare, based on, of course, their previous Half-Life mod. Because it was such a small team, however, they needed funding, and they needed it fast. And this is where Kickstarter came in. After its already established fan base as a mod burst into the scene with a Kickstarter campaign raising nearly $86,000, this was enough to give the developers that boost they needed to release the game independently without any publishing house in 2012. And release this beast of a game, oh boy, they definitely did. If Age of Chivalry was Miss Marvel, Chivalry Medieval Warfare was the boys. Grit, death, blood and gore was everywhere. A complete dedication to creating a premium hack and slash first person medieval simulator. Maps were bigger than before, game modes were more intense, death animations were eye narrowingly disgusting in the best way possible. On the 16th of October 2012, Chivalry Medieval Warfare took the gaming world by storm. And being so soon after the release of Mountain Blade Warband, the growing want for historical titles, especially set in the time of knights and honour, was very apparent. And Chivalry capitalised on this without question. Initially, the title was PC exclusive. However, after its massive success, later it came to PS3 and Xbox 360 in 2014. But how did it get this massive success? How did it get so big? Back upon its release, there was a massive push in this new wave of promotion. You see, in 2012, it was the time of the rising gamers online. Total Biscuit, Rooster Teeth, The Oxcast, Angry Joe, all incredibly massive channels with incredibly massive and, more importantly, dedicated fan bases. Torn Banner were one of the early adoptions in this new style of promotion. It was cheap and, judging by the results, very effective. I remember the first days of seeing this game with the massive battles put together with these big YouTubers. I was blown away. I had never seen anything like it and my 13-year-old brain was in tatters. Seeing the village raids, killing villagers, stealing their chickens before pushing battering rams to the gates and all whilst being bombarded with arrows and catapult projectiles. All of this resulted in a massive positive critical reception. People praising the boldness of Torn Banner to lean into that ultra-violent medieval style of game. However, there were also some negatives to this. There seemed to be a lack of content and once the first initial hype had died down, people were questioning whether there was really enough for it to stand on its own two feet. The title, after all, had limited classes and only a few different environments. The maps that were in the game all felt a little bit samey. It seemed that Torn Banner had nailed the mechanics and gameplay down, but not necessarily the facilities to keep Chivalry Medieval Warfare in people's consciousness for a long span of time. So, something else had to be done. August of 2013, Chivalry Deadliest Warrior was released. Yep, <laughs> do you remember that show? God damn it, I love that show. Chivalry Deadliest Warrior, by the way, was an American TV show. It put famous leaders and units from history against each other that wouldn't normally have fought. You know, that kind of Napoleon versus George Washington, Genghis Khan versus Leonidas, Donald Trump versus... Sanity. It was incredibly cringy. 
but incredible at the same time. The show Deadliest Warrior saw the game Chivalry Medieval Warfare and thought that it was the perfect title to release a tie-in for, and they were kind of right, at least on paper. Chivalry Deadliest Warrior expansion was weird, and I mean really weird. It was this standalone expansion, but it still had all the guts and internals that made Chivalry great. So the gameplay was on point, the combat was as brutal and bloody as ever. Playing as samurai, spartan, viking, knights, ninjas or pirates, you were pit in a fight to the death. It was an insane concept that resulted in, well, a bit of a lackluster gaming experience, except from that fantastic chivalry combat that was already implemented. Like the first game though, this expansion also suffered from similar issues, most notably content. Being multiplayer only and with only a few classes and a limited amount of maps, after the first few months, Chivalry Deadliest Warrior was, well, pretty much dead. All in all, it was an incredibly silly and fun experience and I think a lot of people look back on it with fond nostalgia. Was it a fantastic game? No, but it was a lot of fun. After their release in 2014 for the console and of course this Deadliest Warrior expansion, not much else came out. Many speculated that they had come, conquered and left until 2019. Maud Howe had just released, another first person slash em up. It was clear that the fans of the old chivalry were still around and kicking. Maud Howe was a completely refined and improved version of the first game, and it became bigger than chivalry ever could. Yet Torn Banner weren't done yet. They saw Maud Howe, a game that had taken inspiration from their first title, and said, we can do better than that. They weren't ready to give up that medieval slasher crown to the new boys just yet. Thus, in 2019, just a couple months after Mordhau released, Chivalry 2 was announced with a fantastic trailer. And boy, well, this is where it gets embarrassing. For me by the way, not chivalry. This was just over a month after Maud Howe had released. The hype train had left the station and we were all on board. I loved Maud Howe. Many of us did. We were in love with this new refined combat, the slicker style and beautiful graphics, the large scale and customization that the game implemented. So seeing Chivalry 2 being announced shortly after Maud Howe's massive rise to fame almost felt a bit like the old man coming back and saying how good it was back in the day. At this point, we all remembered Chivalry 1 fondly, but that game was old news now, we had Maud Howe, so why were they coming back to make a second game? There was also that announcement that Chivalry 2 would be exclusive to the Epic Game Store for the first 12 months and all this resulted in, well, pretty negative reception if I'm going to be honest, but I'm going to hold my hands up and say, I was wrong, we were wrong, but boy am I glad we were. On the 8th of June it arrived, Chivalry 2 on the Epic Game Store, bigger maps than ever. Even bigger than Maud Howe, more bloody combat, more game modes, more insane gameplay, being able to interact with the maps in any way possible. Picking up barrels, chickens, bells, chucking them at the enemy, opponents sent flying by ballista bolts and pinned up against the wall. It was all out chaos. And honestly, that first few weeks of Chivalry 2's release was some of the funnest times I've had in gaming full stop. The title focused purely on silly slapstick violence. It didn't take itself too seriously and managed to carve itself a path alongside Maud Howe, and not in its place. The game was received very positively, most referencing the Monty Python style comedy that was implemented throughout the game. Combat was greatly improved from the past title, being able to hold blocks made it much more accessible to a newer and thus wider audience. Weapons felt heavier and deadlier than ever, being able to swipe with massive two-handed swords chopping through multiple enemies at once, decapitating them or finding any limb that they weren't using at that time. Brawl mode was then introduced in October that year, and more recently on the 12th of June this year, the game came out onto Steam with the new Tenosian update, an entirely new faction never seen before in the Chivalry franchise, almost bringing a new fresh layer of paint to the game itself. This franchise is something special. It has had its ups and definitely had its downs, yet with Chivalry 2 being the biggest and most popular yet, it seems like we're still on the rise. There is still more free content to come within this latest game and I for one cannot wait to get my hands on it because I think there are more chapters to come in the evolution of chivalry.